All right, I think we have everybody in from the waiting room currently. We're excited to have Mark Lordson here to provide us a discussion on interactive checklists. I am going to Michelle, you went mute. We still have people coming in. And you're on mute, uh, Shelly, if if you want, if you care to be. But I will get started. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, this is Mark Lawrenson with Capstone Practice Systems, and uh, our topic today is interactive checklists. And I'm indebted to Shelly for suggesting this topic because. I've written about it recklessly in a book and uh, some articles as a good idea, but I've never really delved into it in much depth, let alone built a few that are that deserve that title. <laughs> so hope you will join me on this journey through some interesting ideas. Um, today's session is going to be pretty rapid fire. We have an hour. Of, um, it's going to be somewhat conceptual, but I'm going to be showing concrete examples and going under the hood a bit to get into the uh, the details of how this stuff works. And I should say that this these um, sessions in general are aimed at a nonprofit legal services audience. Uh, I noticed that there are others that are from other sectors of the community where you're most welcome. If you're not already supporting legal aid somehow, you should do so uh, either technologically or financially, uh, but we encourage you to, to uh, join our community. <clears throat> um, I, would, I, I would think most people would agree that checklists are extremely handy. Uh, especially as you get older in life, uh, shopping lists are are uh, pretty inescapable when you're going grocery shopping or other. Uh, but in, in areas of life like aeronautics, pre-flight checks are critical. Uh, making sure that all of the various systems are working before you leave the ground and endanger your passengers. And in surgery, it's been shown that even very simple checklists can have remarkable impacts on the incidence of, of failures and problems. Uh, you know, make sure you wash your hands, do the obvious things, make sure you confirm that you're operating on the left leg, not the right leg, uh, or the right patient. Count the, the sponges before you're, you sew somebody back up. Make sure you haven't left something inadvertently inside of them that's gonna cause trouble. So checklists are all over the place and they certainly have a role in law. Checklists are not simply things to do. They're not just to-do lists necessarily. They're also things to think about, things to consider while you're making a choice or making a plan, things to take into account. And we talk a lot about knowledge management these days. In any organization, checklists can be used to, to capture and to share complex processes so that you don't have to run around looking for uh, how to do something or track down somebody who knows better than you. Uh, these are incredibly important in various contexts, surprisingly effective, but very often overlooked. Uh, there's a good uh, article on Wikipedia that includes a list of various airplane crashes that have been attributed to simple checklist failures. Somebody just forgot to check something, and they took off uh, without checking and caused a lot of uh, deaths in the process. There's a good book by Atul Gawande, many of you are familiar with, a surgeon at Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston, the checklist manifesto that documents some of those kinds of failures and also the surgical uh, impacts that I mentioned a minute ago. Now there's a lot of related concepts. Uh, To-do lists, as I mentioned, is a what we usually think of. Instructions more generally uh, are, are forms of checklists that guide somebody through a process, even how-to videos on, on YouTube to deal with a plumbing problem or other common issues. Reminders, recipes, of course, uh, have lists of ingredients and steps to follow, uh, sometimes with variations built in. If you're a vegan, you know, you can substitute this for that. Uh, algorithms more generally are, are checklists of sorts. They're processes that have been formalized and procedures that have been organized into a, a computable, computable form. Uh, we also think of flowcharts and various kinds of workflows. Uh, or process maps as checkups, uh, as checklists. And then checkups is another variety where you're really stepping somebody through a number of considerations to be taken into account uh, in facing a situation they may be unfamiliar with. On the right here, I've got a, um, 
uh, an image of one way in which we sometimes conceive of checklists as uh, organizing jobs into steps and then the steps into one or more one or more tasks. I like to think of uh, the checklists kind of fall on, a, on a, a spectrum. There are most checklists we deal with are static and they don't change as we use them. They're not customized to us individually. They may be on paper. They may be online, but they're just there. They're a list of things that uh, you follow and then you're done. But as you move up to various forms of automation, first of all, you hit the idea of personalized or customized checklists, where there's some interaction with a user uh, that results in the checklist being customized to their circumstances, to their goals. A little more automated is the kind of interactive checklists, which are the focus of today's talk, where there's some dynamism in them, where as they're being used in real time, the checklists react. As you check off things, other things appear. Some things disappear because you've already done them. Uh, and if you move further along the spectrum, you might get to what we could call intelligent checklists using some of the breaking tools like chat GPT and all the large language models we're, we're so infatuated with today, where it's not simply a preordained um, workflow of what to do that's interactive, but where it's more intelligent, where it's going out and, and noticing things about the world and organizing knowledge for you. We're not gonna get into that today, but I think that is inevitably uh, in our future. There are several other kinds of application types that are quite similar that have overlapping features. Obviously, various forms of form generators or document assemblers are, are quite common in the legal world. Guided interviews, these dynamic questionnaires that take somebody through a, a complex landscape of issues and decisions to be made, perhaps resulting in a document or two or three or 20 being assembled. Various kinds of analytical advisors that do the same thing, not for the sake of generating a document, but giving you some insight into how to understand a, pro, uh, a problem or decompose a situation so that you can act appropriately. And then there are also various kinds of decision support tools that use similar techniques to, to organize the, the, uh, the thinking through of options and factors and considerations and evaluative perspectives that may be necessary to appropriately make a good a good choice. Many kinds of users in the law context, certainly clients uh, who perhaps in combination with their attorney um, would be guided through a process of, of describing their circumstances and deciding what to do and actually doing some things on, on their own behalf. Unrepresented litigants, of course, is a common target of the kinds of applications we talk about on MSN TAP and in the legal aid world. Then there are the advocates themselves, the practitioners, the client servers in programs uh, whose own processes often uh, present tasks to be done, which the particular practitioner may not be expert in. So a checklist there is helpful. And even for experts, as we've seen, even for expert surgeons, a simple checklists that state the obvious very often make the difference between a happy result and an unhappy one. Managers of organizations and other, other staff uh, have all kinds of activities they need to do that are amenable to checklist uh, formalization. And people who are handling calls, uh, whether it's technical support staff or hotline um, managers, uh, having an interactive checklist that can be dynamic uh, for a given call, a given conversation, very often can result in more complete advice and assistance for somebody. So there are plenty of use cases in law. On the right here, I've got a, a snap of an article I wrote 20 years ago about this idea of uh, uh, smart pads on the, on the web that were back in the day when it was possible for the first time to be online without being connected to anything. And thinking through how that could change law practice, how, could, how, it, how it could change uh, uh, trial work, where you can cross-examine a witness with a interactive uh, transcript or, or checklist in front of you, as they answer questions, you, it can suggest other avenues for further uh, investigation and interrogation. And for things like opening and closing a case, administrative processes, preparing uh, to depose somebody or to negotiate on behalf of your client. All these things, there's routine steps, tasks that one ought to do uh, as a best practice to do that kind of a job. 
And a checklist is one way to organize your activities so you're doing the right thing. And then there's things like getting a travel expense reimbursement, which uh, some people find very, very painful. Managers uh, often need to onboard new hires or offboard people who are leaving. Uh, there's uh, interesting, complex processes involved in choosing, uh, procuring technology and services, and then deploying the results. And for unrepresented litigants, which I'll mostly talk about today, um, there are, there, are <clears throat> there are tasks to be done, uh, like filing and serving a complaint or responding to a, a complaint that seem obvious to anybody who's been active in the legal process for a while, but for the average person are far from obvious and uh, uh, involve many different possible pitfalls and problems. Uh, for instance, what, what should I do when I go in for my divorce hearing? What should I say? Well, how should I dress? What should I uh, not do? What should I not say? Now, checklists have some common ingredients. Um, and these are, this is a list. Uh, one is uh, just the variables, pieces of data that are different from case to case. Obviously, if a checklist is to be interactive, it needs to elicit from the user some information about their situation, their, their goals, what they've already done, what they have yet to do, what of events have occurred that might impact the recommended next steps. Then there are computations or inferences you can draw from this raw data that you might gather from a user. Uh, there are conditions, if then uh, branches in, in the logic. So if you're in this county, make sure you do this when you go to the courthouse. But if you're in this county, you have to bring a different form or, or speak a different language, or use a different vocabulary to accomplish the same result. Then the third major ingredient is repetition. Uh, it's very often the case that there are certain things that need to be done more than once or certain forms of information that need to be gathered more than once. Uh, maybe there are uh, multiple children involved in a case or multiple defenses in an eviction or multiple guarantors in a, in a uh, financial transaction. So those are the key ingredients, variables, computations, conditions, and repeats or repetition. And with them, you can accomplish quite a lot in, in any of these contexts I've described so far. Then there are many variations. So a checklist, an interactive checklist can be presented via a web app, which I'll show some examples of, or a smartphone app, or it could be a, a chat bot, an intelligent chat bot, or a, a system that interacts with you via text messages or a smart speaker. Uh, sometimes it is simply text, but often they can present infographics or provide some forms of interactive visualization um, as part of the, the process of, of working with the user. It may be standalone just to do what it does, or it might be built as part of a broader application, maybe as part of a document automation process. You generate all these documents, and now you've got some tests to take care of to actually proceed with using them in the, in the case. And finally, they sometimes are done as, as simply one time, a single one and done. Uh, you use it and you're done with it, you throw it away. Other times, it's a process that goes on across time. You want to be able to uh, interact with a checklist, use it for a while, save your, your responses, save the state of the, of the checklist, and then come back and resume. So I've done this. This has now happened. Now what should I do? Um, one way to display this kind of knowledge to a user is via uh, flowcharts or decision trees. These can get quite complex, as you can tell from these examples. One is a divorce process flowchart uh, from Michigan Legal Help. And for somebody who's comfortable with this mode of expression, you can follow through and see where you go in the various arrows and where it branches, which branch you're on, and get to a, an end result and understand the landscape of the, uh, of the overall process. This one from Arizona Court, court Help, uh, it's a little more graphical and simplified. But once again, it's, it gives you a lay of the land, gives you an overall view. There are plenty of apps online uh, and elsewhere that you can look at that, that use this basic idea. This one is from the Gavel Marketplace. Gavel used to be called Documate. As some of you know, it's one of the document automation tools. Uh, but this is a, 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 a checkup for insurance claims in Canada. So if you're about to, to have to deal with an insurance company, this will give you some pre- uh, advice about how to best do it and what to expect and uh, how to deal with uh, the company if it's not acting fairly. 
Uh, this is yet another variety. This is my own uh, side project called Choice Boxer, which is kind of a, a checkbox uh, for, for choices where you have options. In this case, you know, choices of an expert system platform. You've got different uh, factors or considerations that differentiate them where you they, they are of different degrees of goodness from your perspective uh, on these different factors. And then you may also have different degrees of importance. How important to you is functional completeness versus ease of use, for instance. And moreover, this can vary by person. So if you have a team of people trying to choose uh, a product, you can use this to organize the collective thinking, kind of a checklist of considerations to take into account. Uh, I'm gonna show some more specific examples now to get away from my slides. Let me, let me open this first one. This is um, an application I helped build about eight years ago for a self-help center in San Diego that was helping um, people who couldn't afford lawyers or didn't want a lawyer uh, to file for a conservatorship on behalf of an adult child or other relative who was not able to manage their own affairs. So this illustrates some of the basic ideas. I think if I click on it, I should go right to it. Now this, by the way, is, um, let me just minimize some of my Zoom Chrome here. Uh, this is a first introduction for some of you to this Law Help Interactive Service. I, I think most people know about this. But this is a wonderful national service. It's been around almost 20 years, operated by Pro Bono Net in New York. And uh, it hosts thousands of these kind of modules, mostly for document automation. A lot of guided interviews that lead to a document, and a lot of other kinds of interactive tools to help people deal with legal problems, either on behalf of clients as an advocate or as an unrepresented litigant yourself. Uh, this one that I just clicked on is for uh, uh, generating all the paperwork needed to produce a limit of conservatorship petition in uh, San Diego. And I'm coming in, I think I have to log in since my session died. Let me do that quickly. You can use, you can use this service anonymously or you can establish an account and screw up your password. And the advantage of having an account is you can save your answers. So I happen to have sometime in the past, a set of answers for a case in connection with this particular application. Let me, the Lynn family, totally imaginary. And I can bring that up rather than having to type in front of you and make all kinds of mistakes. So here we are, this is the application itself. It's a guided interview. This happens to be using a tool called Hot Docs. Uh, it's really, this one is, is for advocates, navigators, more so than the unrepresented litigants. So it's in a self-help assisted pro se setting. And it's designed, and, and this has not been actively used in a couple of years, I don't think there may be another replacement for it. Um, but it's designed to be used when someone comes through and says, hey, we really need to get a conservatorship for Mary or whoever we're doing it for, help me generate all the forms and, and un undertake the process to accomplish this goal. So the advocate would sit down with the client or the uh, unrepresented litigant and go through these questions. So it's kind of a checklist. It's a, it's a interactive questionnaire. You decide what kind of case you're pursuing. Where are you? What course will you be in? What courthouse, I'm sorry. Uh, who are the parties, the conservatee and the conservator or conservators? Um, who's going to be the petitioner. I won't dwell too much on this, but this is a common application type we see quite a bit. As I mentioned, there are thousands of these on Law Help Interactive or LHI, as we call it. And it just drills down upon all the information about the various parties um, and their circumstances and what's going on. Someone is just developmentally disabled. Uh, what medications do they use? Who are the relatives and friends and neighbors within several degrees of cons consanguinity that need to be known about, specified in the forms, and if alive, identified and, and notified about the pendency of this petition? So you would go through this entire process. Um, when you get near the end, uh, you'll see a list of all the various forms you could generate. Many of these are pre-checked for you based upon your answers to prior questions. 
and they're organized into several rounds or tranches of filings. You may need to come back to do a second filing. So this is a case where you'd save your answers, resume, and come back later and produce further documents. And there's a little bit of guidance about what you do next. Um, let's just go ahead and say, okay, we've spent enough time in here. Uh, we've answered all the questions we care to answer. Let me generate, uh, and there's some questions maybe that were not required that I left them unanswered. Uh, let me go now and generate the forms. And there are several dozen forms I learned uh, for conservatorships in California. Uh, in, an, in an average case, you may need to do a dozen or more. And in this situation, voila, within three seconds, um, the application has produced a 41 page set of all the forms uh, for pursuing a conservatorship, the petition and uh, all the other documents that are necessary. Some that need to be filed and served, some of which are under seal, uh, et cetera. Quite an impressive job to produce this beautiful set of forms uh, for you, saving a lot of time, you answer questions once, et cetera. But of course, the natural question is, great, this is wonderful. I have all my forms. What do I do next? And that's where, that's where a checklist might come in. So let me go back to my slides. Um, OK, here I am. OK, so that was one example that didn't quite, it was kind of a checklist deprived example. It didn't really take us to this place we want to be. But it illustrated some of the common features, the idea of variables or fields, the idea of conditionality. For instance, in that interview, if you said, I want to I want to request a fee waiver, it'll present questions necessary to elicit the information to produce a fee waiver motion and associated documents and then generate that for you. But let me bring up another example. This is a yet another complex form. This one is in Washington State, one of my favorite examples. So this one is a uh, uh, file for divorce. Now I'm still logged in and I'm going to uh, once again go and say, let's use some answers. I have a, a set of mostly gibberish answers, I believe, for this imaginary case. But this is a similar, a similar experience, right? We've got a, a long list of, of dialogues or pages that somebody just starting would need to go through. Uh, there's various kinds of instructions and guidance along the way. Um, and there are all the variables, all the all the questions. When were you married? Um, where were you married? Who are you? Have you been separated? More information about this person. You know, I have this given give a gibberish name. Um, the spouse. Uh, are you pregnant or is your spouse pregnant? Are there any children? Uh, are they joint or separate? Um, do you want to pursue a parenting plan uh, in this context? Do you expect to need to file 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 one? Um, Again, once again, it, it, it goes through, it has repetition, uh, various multiple forms of property, uh, various debts someone may need to deal with. Uh, and you would spend as much time here as you need to be guided through the steps of, of describing uh, your desired divorce process for the purposes of generating documents. And when you get to the very end of this one, uh, let me see here. Yeah, uh, there is some guidance. You know, you're you're uh, you know congratulated for doing a good job and completing the interview. Uh, you're told which documents are going to be generated, and again, this varies based upon your facts and and your choices earlier. Uh, there's some guidance about about downloading them, then, but there's not much other guidance here. Now, the difference about this one example is that if I finish this. <clears throat> um, and I ask the, the, the site to generate the documents for me. In this case, it's going to generate um, not a single PDF document with all the individual forms concatenated inside of it. It's going to generate um, seven or eight Word documents individually as separate files that you can download and uh, edit if necessary locally and, uh, and file. But they include instructions. That's the critical step that I think is different here. So <clears throat> now I've got my, my various documents to download. I won't go into all of them. But let me just download these instructions. So here we go. So this is a personalized set of instructions customized for this specific person. 
uh, based upon the answers they gave in their interview on this day, right? And it tells them, here are the documents, make sure you got them all. Uh, there may be more documents in, under a different fact pattern. And then each of those documents in turn has got a, uh, a, a cover sheet with instructions particular to that form. So it's really a great, uh, I like think a best practice for how you, how you organize uh, the provision of, of instructions and guidance to a user who's not familiar with the terminology and the processes they're about to have to embark upon. And so the steps are, are explained with nice ideographs, um, tells you what you should do next. Um, and once again, there's handy room here. So with a pen, if you print this out, you can, you can check off these things as you do them. Uh, and and I find it just an extraordinarily useful uh, useful tool. Lots of information, all the information you need, uh, what to do if you have more questions, voila. So um, once again, this is this is personalized, customized. It's not interactive at this stage, right? So you're in a document, it's a static document, but it's taken into account most of the variations peculiar uh, to your your circumstances. All right, let me get back to my, my slides. So, uh, all right, one, one, one critical thing I forgot to show you. Let me, uh, uh, in addition to all these documents, and by the way, I should give credit to Lori Garber, who may be on this call. Lori is the main author of this application. She's an attorney at the Northwest Justice Project, and she's worked uh, tirelessly to build this and many other uh, similar applications for Washington State. Uh, but one of the cool features she and I uh, and others worked on is this idea of next steps. So on top of everything else we've seen, we've got this intelligent interview that we've been through with all kinds of guidance along the way. We have um, the documents we can generate with, with customized instructions, both, both in general and specific to particular documents. And then we have this new feature called next steps. And this is basically saying, um, it reminds me I should download my documents and I should save my answers. Yeah, I'm just gonna do that. I didn't change anything, I don't think, but I'm gonna save just to be compliant. So now I've tucked away the latest set of answers to the, to the questions I was dealing with. But now when I click the next step box, it is the system as a whole is offering me next things I can do right here on Law Help Interactive. So you'll notice, you may remember that in the interview, we said we wanted to get a fee waiver. We uh, believe we needed to make a par parenting plan. <clears throat> and elsewhere in there, there was a decision about whether to generate a child support worksheet and order, proposed order. And so these things are now set up. The system knows based upon the facts in your answer set that these steps are appropriate for you to do next. And if I now wanna say, okay, yeah, I do wanna get a fee waiver. It was not generated as part of the initial divorce process, but I'm taken to a next uh, module on the Law Help Interactive Service specific to waiving a filing fee. And what's cool is that all the information I had entered uh, in the earlier interview, my great unusual name, et cetera, has been carried forward. So it knows everything about me that I've provided to the system. And it's, it's a form of, uh, of checklist of, of process guidance that I think is quite creative and useful. All right, so that's the that's the file for divorce Washington Forms Online. It illustrates this idea of, of in interview customization of, of some instructions and in document instructions uh, that are customized not only to the user situation, but to the specific documents that are part of the package that's been assembled for the user. One other example, this, this shows a different interface. This is the A to J interface. Again, it's running on the Law Help Interactive Service. I'm not gonna bother opening an answer set on this one. And for those of you that are familiar with A to J, A to J is a more of a graphical uh, interface. Uh, it's got an avatar uh, of, of an advisor. Optionally, you can have an avatar for yourself. Um, and this, and, and this is organized kind of a, in, as a pathway to a courthouse or to another form of ultimate relief. Um, this was done as part of an ABA project, I believe. I was not part of it. But here you're, you're being stepped through a, a very, very simplified user experience, uh, not as much text, not as, not as heavy a, 
a screen as the ones we've seen so far. Um, but I can I can go through and enter information and uh, say I have a problem with the rental unit or I'm looking for one and I won't go through it all. Am I being evicted? No, I'm not being evicted. Has the landlord done any of these things? No. I have bed bugs. No. So it's 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 a it's a form of a checkup. Again, it's stepping you through. Did, did it return my secure deposit? No. Uh, I won't go through more. But as as I answer questions, I'll move along these steps to, to the end result. And based upon my answers, I'll be guided to some useful resources to help me uh, deal with my my situation. So think of that as an example of a checkup. Um, and it, in, in this case, again, it doesn't produce a document per se. It generates a link to a uh, to a, an external page. So you can think of it as kind of a pathfinder example. I'll, at the end of this session, I'm going to show you another just very brief proof of concept I cooked up uh, for this very occasion. That's more of an interactive checklist that actually does things as you use it. So stay tuned for that. But first, let me just identify some obvious problems and challenges, complications. Um, some of these processes can be quite complex, as we know. Uh, it may be that you should do X or Y, but if you've already done Z, you shouldn't do X or Y, you should do Q. Uh, so how do you code? How do you, how do you express and organize that knowledge to help somebody uh, work their way through a process? Sometimes checklists are, are disordered. Order is not important. Uh, when you go to the grocery store, it's not important which order you buy things, uh, although it might be more efficient to do it in the order in which you encounter them in the aisles. But many, many processes, of course, have sequences uh, built into them. You, you have to do one thing in, able, in order to be able to do another thing, and you can't do certain things until other things have happened or you've done things. So that needs to be taken into account and built in to any kind of an application. Often you have multiple users, multiple people involved, multiple actors. Uh, there may be approvals necessary or some forms of delegation. Uh, and so if you can also see the lawyer-client scenario where there's some things the client can and should do. There's some things the lawyer can or should do. And ideally, those, those are organized and choreographed into a common framework so that as, as the process proceeds, each party knows to know what to do and does their appropriate steps. And then, of course, there's always the question uh, whether these kinds of applications are improper legal advice uh, given outside of a lawyer-client relationship. Uh, that's be you know many even the simple form filler applications have been accused of that. Let alone the current uh, round of of uh, chat GTP and related tools. Uh, my own my own philosophy has long been that uh, we are and should be free. To code the law in various ways. And at least in the United States, the First Amendment protects code and software applications just as much as it protects books and pamphlets and videos and other forms of, of expressing knowledge and sharing information. But be aware that may come up if you're doing these kinds of applications. Someone may, may uh, raise some questions about the legitimacy of helping somebody work through a process when they're not paying a lawyer or engaging a lawyer to do that. Speaking of artificial intelligence, um, there's there's quite a bit of useful literature. I just recently read this top article about law maps, um, which is fascinating. It's a, it's an attempt to automate some of the process of extracting the structure of statutes and other kind and, and processes, legal processes, uh, and visualizing them um, on behalf of litigants. Um, I think that's worth a look. There's a link in these slides for all the stuff I'm showing. By the way. And the slides I will be, be available from Shelley at LSN tap when we're done. And then recently I've been reading about process mining, which is somewhat new to me, but it's a fascinating discipline having to do with techniques to, to take to extract uh, uh, intelligence from large collections of, of event logs. Right. So if you're in, in, in a situation where uh, um, users or staff or other people have been interacting with a, a tool or, or doing tasks, and you've got a large collection of data, very often you can extract implicit structures and, and charts and frameworks from them. Um, so check that out if it's of interest to you. 
Um, let me um, pause for a moment and just talk about the tools to make these uh, kinds of applications. We've seen the end user experience, um, both of an A to J author application and a hot docs one. I wanna give you a little look at how those work under the covers, uh, but there are plenty of other tools. Uh, popular now are tools like Brighter, Gavel, Legito, Neotologic's been around a long time. And as some of you may know, there, there are hundreds of these out there in the world. Um, my friend, Catherine Bamford had published a list of over 250 document automation tools alone. But let me skip over uh, to A to J. So we've seen this uh, end user experience for an A to J application. And I'm gonna go to where this thing gets, where these things get built and maintained. I didn't build that one, but let me show you one just, just to give you an example. So we built an application for handling appeals of denials of FEMA benefits. And uh, in A to J Author, which is a freely available website you can sign up for and, and create these yourselves, it's got all the basic features of document automation and these interactive checklist ideas. So there's various kinds of variables, a universe of data points that you identify uh, that need to be elicited from a user and used perhaps in generating a document. You've got various steps you can organize your, your uh, questions into. The questions themselves can be organized into specific pages that present the questions and there's logic among the questions. So based upon the answers the user gives to various questions, other questions may or may not appear. And you can visualize that flow uh, with a built-in mapper that, that sort of builds a dynamic uh, decision tree or flow chart for you of how your questions work. And this is useful for debugging and designing. Uh, and then when you're once you've got everything organized pretty well, you can write in the authoring environment you can preview the user experience. And this is the example of the, uh, the FEMA uh, appeals request. In this case, it would I won't do it, I won't go through it, but it'll, it'll generate all the documents you need to request your file and, and has a cover sheet of instructions, just like we were sh showing before. Let me just show you the same thing behind the scenes for uh, the uh, divorce application I showed you. So this is the Washington State divorce application, not necessarily the latest version of it. I've just downloaded it sometime in the past. And so this consists um, in, in a similar way of a large collection, a much, much larger collection of variables. These are all the text variables. There are a number of variables. There are date variables. There are true false variables. These are all the moving parts that are used across the whole range of, of forms and questions and various computations um, that need to be drawn uh, from those from the answers that may be given by the user. Um, and uh, but I want to show you the instructions document. So and very quickly, this is a, a typical template in a tool like Hot Docs. It's got variables, you know, for today and other things, but it also has conditionality. So if you're in King County or if you're in Pierce County, different, uh, abbreviations will be used to describe the court form because they have different names in those different counties. So that's a simple example. But remember I told you that there are on that list of documents, there were seven, I think, in the example I showed. But if in fact you've got a spouse that uh, needs to be served outside of Washington, there's another form and there's another step to be done. But that only gets included in your instructions if it is applicable to you. And uh, Lori has done a great job in, in building in all these variations to produce an incredibly personalized, helpful um, uh, set of instructions for you. One thing I, th I think is especially interesting is she's got a section in here to handle the possibility the user has left out answers to some important questions. Now you can always make answers required on these applications, but if you do that, the user would not be allowed to proceed. If it's a required question, it has to be answered. And there might be some information a user needs to go look up or find or doesn't want to answer today, but they want to proceed. They want to save their answers. They want to generate a draft document. And so this section uh, goes through in, in quite a bit of detail, touching on various pieces of information that might have been necessary uh, for a complete set of forms to alert the user in the instructions, you know, you really ought to go back and answer a few more questions regenerate all this stuff and uh, you'll be better off and, and uh, 
you know, you're more likely to achieve the results you want. So just an example of how you can use conditionality and various forms of variables, even repetition inside of a, a, a document template to generate this experience of, of customization. Let's see, okay. There are, uh, as you might expect, there are commercial checklist builders. I haven't really looked at these very much, um, which lets you go and create nice checklist-like documents. I'm not sure they offer any of the interactivity that I was showing here today, but uh, check them out. And of course, there are tools like SharePoint, which have built-in facilities for doing quite sophisticated workflows. Uh, and uh, if you have, if you're a SharePoint organization, you may be familiar with them, or you can you can you can, you can implement your your checklist ideas using SharePoint. I want to wrap up with a, a closing example, and then we'll have some time for questions or comments if there are any. This goes back to the uh, conservatorship example, and uh, I remember being quite confused myself as a non practitioner in that area about how it all worked. What do you do with all these forms? How do you get them filed? Um, and I can imagine the average litigant who's been helped by somebody at a self-help center would be somewhat uh, at a loss to know how to handle this. So there are quite good uh, online resources from the court and other providers that uh, in plain language explain how to do these things, how to answer common questions, what steps you do, what do I do, how do I fill out this form? Once again, a classic example of a static checklist. It's, it's one size fits all. It just tells people, this is what you do in general. We're not talking about you, we're talking about the uh, general person who's facing these kind of problems. Uh, there can be guidance inside of the instructions, but that's about it. So this is where I was thinking, suppose somebody had used that, that, that uh, module I showed earlier of a conservatorship petition uh, form preparer that generated these 41 pages of forms. So you've, you've done that, and you're at the now what stage. So this is the, I just spent a few hours building this, but this is an example of what I would consider an interactive checklist. So what do I have to do now? I fill out the forms, What's what do I do next? And uh, this is just a, a screenshot of it, but I'll bring it up live. Once again, this is running on the Law Help Interactive service. It was built in Hot Docs. And in a moment, I'll show you how it was built. But now this is a this is a one page uh, interview. So you notice there's no there's no outline here because there's only one of these guys, and it's on one level it's quite simple. Uh, so what do I do now? Okay, I need to make two copies. Okay, I've done that. Having done that, these other things now become visible. You notice before I check that, everything else is grayed out and non actionable. So I'll say yes, make two copies. Good. Now. I see this thing, bring the copies to the probate business office. Ah, what's this little um, light bulb over here? Well, it's a bit of guidance. So this is a, a bit of help contextualized to this task. Uh, and it's got some text in it telling us what's gonna happen, but it also has a link. And it shows me where the, the uh, probate business office is and when they're open, et cetera. Um, let me go back. I always find with uh, okay. Um, you can't see my toolbar, but that gets in the way sometimes. Okay, so let's keep going. So we're going to say, all right, we follow those instructions. Okay, we're going to bring the copies. Now we have to, we either pay the filing fee or apply for and get a fee waiver. Um, Let's say we pay the filing fee. Notice that the apply for and get a fee waiver has disappeared. If I had chosen that other path, uh, I said I'm going to apply for and I succeeded in getting it. I don't need to worry about paying. So a very simple illustration of this conditionality among tasks to be done. And again, this is high, highly simplified just to show some ideas. Now, having done that, got my fee waiver, I brought the copies. I now need to actually make sure I get them back stamped. Uh, by the court with a docket number, presumably, and a hearing date. So I've now done that. And you could provide a little bit of uh, uh, encouragement to the user saying, great, you've done it. Good good going. Keep going. All right, now I need to do two things. <clears throat> I need to serve a copy 
on the proposed conserva T, and I need to at least mail copies to each of the identified relatives that are living and other people that have to be notified. And so these are two steps. I have to do both of them. And having done those, now I'm, I'm eligible to take the next step, which is prepare and file the certificate of service. Again, a, a real example of this would, would take you down the path of maybe a sub checklist of how do you do that uh, and what it's entailed and what's the process of, of creating a certificate of service or maybe more than one. But you can also insert some textual guidance to the user along the way. And then finally, they need to attend the hearing that's been scheduled. And once they've chosen that task, uh, the system can prompt them uh, to uh, describe how it went at their hearing. Uh, so this is mainly an interactive screen. Uh, you don't really need to go anywhere. There's not necessarily a document to generate, although it does have a built-in document assembly feature so that at any stage, depending upon where you are in the process, um, you can go and, and generate your checklist as of that moment, print it out if you need to take it with you offline and see what remains to be done uh, downstream. Um, all right, let me get back. I think I have one more closing uh, page screen. Um, so to recap, I think we can agree checklists are really good, nice things to have, like to see more of them. Uh, if they can be customized to the to someone's circumstances and their goals, that's that's even better, right? It's it's uh, even more useful. And if they can interact with you in real time, and change and and advise you and guide you and and remind you, even better. Uh, they can be somewhat tricky to build. Let me show you. I promised how this uh, how this one was built. So I need to go back into into hot dogs. <laughs> Forgive me for uh, not knowing what I'm doing here. Okay, um, we were looking at the divorce one. I want to show you the checklist one. So this is going to be examples. Okay, this is what this is what's running on on the server. This is my local authoring environment, and not much to show, but I think it's worth showing. Once again, it's got a collection of variables, <clears throat> mostly these true-false variables, which, which correspond uh, to, uh, uh, to actions the user may take, and various kinds of uh, formatting structures. And then there's an interview, which is basically the overarching thing that runs. All it does is ask one dialogue, this so-called welcome dialogue. And this guy right here is where all the action happens. This is the dialogue that presents this experience presents this interactivity. Uh, and the way it do, does it is by just having these various uh, actions, true, false variables present. And then inside of it, it's got a script. It's got a script, it's gonna hide or gray things initially. And then as people answer questions, as things are checked uh, cast, in a cascading way, other things are unchecked. And in some cases, uh, it's showing you a little bit of a support, this yay in bold uh, that you saw. And if you know what you're doing with a tool like Hot Docs or Gavel or any other kind of a tool, A to J, it's not that hard to create these reasonably interactive experiences. And you can imagine going quite, quite a distance, but I wanted to get that out in front of you before we wrapped. So um, let me stop there. Uh, Shelley, you've been monitoring the chat if there's any questions or comments. I would certainly welcome them, and uh, I'm at, I'm all ears. There haven't been any in the in the um, in the chat. I think everybody was just so stunned by all the information coming through. <laughs> so we we do um, welcome questions now. This is your chance to get your questions answered. Um, yeah, I know. Jump in. Go ahead, Shelley. I was just going to ask, so many of the examples, or I guess all of the examples have been um, focused on client um, services. Yeah. Do you know of any uh, um, any checklists being used um, for um, attorney, on the attorney side, so to help them um, meet all the paperwork for a case, for example? 
you know, I, I would assume they're out there, but I haven't, I'm not aware of them. And I didn't uncover them in my brief efforts to organize this talk. So if anybody in the audience knows of some or wants to identify them, that'd be helpful. But as you can see, I think the basic techniques are applicable, whether you're helping a client or an unrepresented litigant deal with a problem or you yourself or your colleagues are doing that. I know the beauty of many of these tools are that they are no code tools. You know, it's, um, and, and I, when I was in law school, for example, I did attend some training for several of them. So they are relatively um, easy to learn as opposed to having to learn to code, um, but it's a way to get guidance for more clients than we can help in person. Exactly. Um, and, and sometimes you, there is a little coding involved. That hot dogs example I showed you, you had to get down and actually write some uh, some script, but it's uh, reasonably straightforward once you once you've been exposed to it. And and platforms like Gavel and Brighter are are much less cody. <laughs> so uh, um, I'm curious if anyone has uh, related ideas have have, in, have encountered these kinds of applications elsewhere or thought about trying to create them. I see Dennis is is uh, in the chat saying, would we consider using GPT tools uh, to do a first draft? I think absolutely. I mean, that's all happened in the last few months, but uh, I'm sure people have already experimented with saying, well, tell me what I should do in this situation. And uh, uh, GPT would would come back with uh, a, a beautifully formatted set of, of steps here, the 12 things you should do. And then you might have a conversation. You might say, well, I've done the first three but I'm stuck on number four. How do I do that? Uh, I think that's inevitable. And and those who talk about no code, those really involve almost no no application building whatsoever uh, at the risk of, of potential hallucinization or, or uh, uh, misinformation that these things can sometimes throw. We do have a question from Catherine in the chat. Have you done any checklists to be used with case management systems such as legal server? I have not, but I think that's a good that's a good connection. Certainly, integrations with tools like Legal Server. I know Law Help Interactive integrates with Legal Server, so you can have a a, a case session uh, in Legal Server, uh, and then press a button and take all the data from that record and transmit it so it pre-populates an online interview. Uh, and I think case managers in general naturally have have these kinds of process management uh, tools, but I have not personally done that. And I think going the other way as well, I would think from, you know, a website and, and have the interview and then populate fields in in the case management system. Absolutely. Yeah, and we're seeing that a lot, you know, with Clio, of course, there's there's integration now with their own in-house uh, document management, document assembly system. Um, so the opportunities to cross those worlds, I think, are are greater than ever. We don't want to have you miss an opportunity to ask questions, but if we don't have questions, we'll let everyone get back to their day. So speak you'll, up you'll, now or send a question to us later and we can see if we can get it answered for you. You'll have the opportunity to re review this recording. If anything went by too fast, I'm happy to react individually. Uh, it's a fun topic. Again, I've I've proselytized checklists, interactive checklists for many years, but I haven't had the chance to think too much about them. So I, I thank Shelly for giving me the chance and for you to put up with this, uh, this presentation. Well, we're not getting any more questions. So I just want to put a reminder out that the video will be posted to our YouTube channel tomorrow morning. And um, if I have the materials from Mark, we'll also get that posted as well. Um, Eric has just thrown a question in the chat. What about flowcharts to help people reach conclusions? Yeah, that's a good one. I think I showed a couple examples of flowcharts. They're much more in the nature of processes as opposed to decisions, uh, but we certainly see those all over the place. And so you can think of a, of a checklist as a kind of flowchart in textual form. Um, but I, I'm especially interested in the, in, the, in the use of interactive visualization, whether it's a flowchart or this idea of a choice box. Uh, to capture complex interacting ideas and coming to an appropriate defensible uh, decision. 
Beautiful. I, I have put the our events page in the chat, and I want to remind everyone that that's where you'll find our upcoming events. We have a glitch right now on times, so I'm not sure it's not displaying accurately, but we will make sure that the registration information has the um, correct times listed for you. We also, I have just finalized um, details for a webinar coming up that will not be recorded, so you must attend if you want to hear it, and that's going to be on office ergonomics. Mm -hmm. So watch for the announcement coming out on that. And the bonus is that um, the expert will be doing live assessments of four offices. So you can submit pictures if you want your office to be assessed and your office may be chosen. So that is a service that can cost a couple of hundred dollars. So this will be an opportunity for you to take advantage of that. So watch for that announcement coming shortly. Thank you so much, Mark, for doing this webinar for us. Thank you everyone for attending and have a pleasant afternoon. We'll see you next time. Thanks everybody.